Okay, so you've just got your Insta360 ONE RS or you're looking at getting one of these cameras and you just want a really quick way to know where all the features and settings are and how to change them to the optimal settings without getting too involved in instruction manuals and things like that. Well, this video is a complete features and settings guide to this camera. We're gonna be going through all the different modes, how to get to them and what settings are best for your camera. We're also gonna be going through the phone app and taking a little look at that. Um, so stick around to the end for that. Let's get into it. Okay, welcome to the calm beaches of Thailand for this Insta360 complete features and settings guide. Let's tap the camera to wake it up from standby. So you'll see that we're not actually in the calm blue beaches of Thailand, um, but there was supposed to be footage from Thailand, but I'll explain all of that in the review. So the first settings we're gonna go through are with the 4K boost lens on, which is the new 4K lens, um, and the settings do change depending on what, which modules you have attached. For now though, let's just see what we've got on screen at the moment. So in the top left, you have the SD card space. That just shows you how much space you have left for a specific mode. So at the moment I'm in 4K and I've got 33 minutes left. If I wanted to change that to say 2.7K, it will show I've got 52 minutes left. On the top right, you've obviously got your ba battery indicator. On the bottom left, it shows you which mode you're in and you can tap that also um, to change the mode. But if you didn't want to tap that button, you can also just swipe across the screen and that also changes the mode as well. And on the bottom right, you can see I've got the current settings for my current mode. So that whole bar at the bottom will show I'm in video mode, shooting 4K, 16 by 9 at 25 frames per second. And if I click that, I can then change my resolution and frame rate in this menu here. And the same is true for all different modes, but they obviously have all different settings, which we'll get into. If you double tap the middle screen, it will enlarge the image to the full size of the screen. Something to note is that double tap in the screen doesn't actually mean you're filming in this ratio here. You are still filming in the usual 16 by nine ratio that you'll see here. Um, all you're doing is filling the screen. So again, you're missing some of the side bits. So like all small cameras and small touch screens, um, the menu is controlled by swiping from different corners of the screen to get to different parts of the menu. So for example, swiping up from the bottom here, you've got your preview menu here. Um, so just going through the preview menu for a second, on the top left, you can click this little button here and you obviously get more of a grid view. From here, you can then tick this tick box here, choose a few different items, and then press the bin to delete them, which I'm not gonna do at the moment. Go back to the regular preview mode. You can obviously play back your videos. So it will tell you there's a video or a photo in the bottom left here. Um, so if I play back the video like so, that plays back the video. And then in the top left here, you'll see a little audio icon. If I wanted to turn the sound on, you might be able to briefly hear that. And then you can use the bottom lip bar here to scrub through the video as much as you want. It's really nice to be able to scrub through the videos to see the bit that you want. Something you actually still can't do on the Sony cameras I use. So let's come out of that menu now. And if you swipe from the right, you'll see all of your camera settings. Let's start off the top. It says we're in auto exposure, but you can switch to manual exposure if you want to. And from manual exposure here, you can set your shutter speed to whatever you want it to be. You can set your ISO and you can set your white balance. At the moment, we're still in auto white balance. I'm actually gonna change the exposure back to auto because generally with my action cameras, I leave everything on auto as it is. On the left here, you've also got your sort of picture profile or color mode. And by default, it is in Vivid. Vivid's quite like a, a vibrant, you know, colorful, that sort of action camera look, um, which is great for straight to social media and if, if that's the look you're going for. Um, but if you wanted a more standard neutral look, you should go to standard. And then of course, you've got log there as well. I don't know if I necessarily recommend switching over to log profile. Um, it's good if you wanna do some serious grading, but this camera is not shooting in a high enough bit rate in order to grade it properly. So you can't push the colors too far. So if you wanted to do like a little bit of grading, I'd still prefer maybe to go standard um, and change the colors that way. So swiping from the right will pretty much do that for every mode, but we'll get into that for the different modes in a sec. What's unique about the menus on this camera is you've got the quick menu up here and the little magnifying glass down here. So if you tap that part of the screen where the quick menu is, it comes up with your quick settings. Now these are just modes that you use sort of regularly. You can change these as much as you want. So let's say the top one says C1 video, 4K, 16 by nine at 60 frames per second. If I come off that and change my settings, for example, let's say I shoot in 2.7K quite a lot at 60 frames per second and I go into the Q menu and let's say I want to save that as my third option 
All I need to do is press this little refresh button and it says save the current shooting parameters this preset, confirm and now every time you want that 2.7K 60 frames per second video, it's there in the quick menu. So it's really easy to change. A quick menu is so handy when using these cameras because you just want to change between settings as quick as possible. And then with magnifying glass, if you tap that part of the screen, you can then change to your different lenses. So you've got ultra wide. If you click that, you go to wide, linear and narrow. Obviously they're gonna be different points of view. You're still using the same lens. All it is really is a digital crop into, I think maybe the sensor, um, which obviously doesn't ruin the quality too much, um, but you do get a different point of view. So if you didn't want the action camera ultra wide look, you can go into narrow, which is saying is around 29 millimeters. You can also use this little bar down here to zoom in as much as you want. Um, but by the time you zoom in that far, you are probably losing a bit of quality. Um, so if you didn't want to use their preset, sort of zoom ranges, you can just zoom using this as much as you want. Okay, and finally swiping from the top gets you to your settings, which is actually where we're gonna start now. So on the top left of these settings, on the first page is just the brightness of the screen. Just tap that and you can adjust how bright or dim you want the screen to be. So we're gonna go somewhere in the middle. You tap off that. On the top right, you have the option to lock the screen. So if you press that, it will lock the screen so that no matter what you touch, nothing is gonna change any of the settings. This is good for if you've got your settings dialed in and you don't wanna to accidentally touch the screen um, or if you're doing some action work and it's like maybe rainy and you don't want the water to like change the settings on the screen like it does, um, this is really handy. And to unlock it, all you have to do is tap somewhere and then swipe up like that and your screen is unlocked. So let's scroll back down again. On the bottom left here, you have your stabilization settings. By default, it's set to standard, um, but you can go to high and you can also go to low. Basically what this is doing is if you're using the stabilization built into the camera, if you're using it on high, there's gonna be quite a delay between moving the camera and actually seeing what you're filming. So if I leave it on high now, and I'm gonna quickly try and demonstrate this without losing focus. So if I move it left, you'll see it takes quite a while to move. And that's because the processing is being done in the camera at the same time, which is obviously slowing down the process um, of displaying it on the screen. If you're doing a lot of action work and you want that really good stabilization, then obviously leave that on high. But sometimes people just want that really low latency between pointing the camera somewhere and actually showing it on the display. And finally, the bottom right option on this first page is whether you want these LEDs on. So you've got LEDs up here, um, which blink depending on if you're recording, if you're in standby, um, but you can turn these off if maybe you're in a dark environment and it's interfering, um, or maybe you just don't want to be as obvious when you're recording. There's also a light on the front as well, which this controls. So you're going over to the second page now, and on the top left, you have the option to turn on your grids. So the grids will give you a little rule of thirds grid, grid if you're trying to frame up a shot. Um, it can be quite handy um, if you're trying to really get that framing right. And again, you tap to turn that off. On the top right is auto rotate. So by default, this is turn off. If you're someone who likes to shoot in portrait mode, if you just turn the screen around like that, it will auto rotate so that all your settings um, then show the correct way. And then if you turn it back, again, it's gonna auto rotate so that your settings will show like that. Again, by default, this is turn off. Um, so if you don't shoot much portrait mode video, then you can probably get away with having this turn off. On the bottom left then is the voice control options. If you turn that on, there's a few different commands you can use um, when the camera is on to start recording and stop recording, etc. So if I go back to the normal menu now and I say, start recording. Start recording. It is a little bit temperamental. It's not particularly sensitive. Um, I don't know whether that's a good thing, but yeah, sometimes it does take a couple of attempts. Stop recording. Stop recording. Now the next option in the bottom right is quick capture. And this is just a really easy way to start recording from when the camera is off. So if I swipe up, you'll see I'm in 4K 16 by nine at 25 frames per second. If I turn the camera off, let's say you see something and you really wanna start recording, but you don't wanna have the faff of turning on the camera, waiting for it to turn on and then press record. All you have to do is press the record button and that will automatically turn the camera on and start recording in the last format that you're in. Just like that. And then once you're done with recording, you can just press the record button again 
and that will stop recording and then turn the camera off automatically. Going over to the next screen now and we've just got our general settings. So if I click them and then if I click onto the top one, which is just general, then at the top we have USB mode. Now this just controls how the camera behaves when you connect it via USB. So by default, this is set to Android. Um, you can have it as just a disc or you can have it as a webcam or a reader. Um, you can just basically choose what you want from here. So if you want to use your camera as a webcam, you can just click webcam mode and that will go into webcam mode when you connect that to your computer. Underneath that, you can choose to turn on or off your prompt sound. Now, every time you start recording, turn the camera on, turn the camera off, there's gonna be a little beep sound that plays, um, which might annoy you. It did with me, so I turn it off straight away. Underneath that, we have Bluetooth wake up, and that's quite an interesting feature, um, which I quite like. Basically, enabling this enables you to wake up your camera uh, via your phone. So if you've got the Insta360 app and your camera is off, you can actually open the app, press connect, and it will turn the camera on for you. This is quite useful maybe if you're setting up the camera in a place that's hard to reach. You don't necessarily want to keep the camera on. You can just set up that camera and then you can walk away. And then when you want to start the recording, you can just get up your phone, turn the camera on with your phone and start recording like that way. Underneath that is webcam zoom. So this has a cool feature in webcam mode where it can sort of zoom in and follow you around. So you can turn on or off that feature here. Underneath that is the auto power off time. So, so obviously after a while of inactivity, it's gonna turn off and you can choose after how long that happens. By default, it's set to three minutes. I think that's kind of reasonable. Underneath that, interestingly, is sharpness. Now this obviously controls the sharpness of your image after recording. And I can't understand why it's hidden in the general menu, um, but I guess it's just so that people don't mess with it too much um, because generally people who are buying this are consumers and Insta360 probably don't want consumers messing around with this um, when they've sort of tuned the image to how they want it. But if you go into sharpness here, the default is very high and it's a very sharp image, which again, I'll get into in my review video. Um, but I do recommend for most people with setting this somewhere between high and medium. Underneath sharpness is anti-flicker, and you're gonna to wanna to set this maybe to auto, um, or depending on what country you're in, it's 50 hertz or 60 hertz. Um, over in Europe, we have 50, so I've just set it to 50, um, so I can change it later. I didn't wanna set it to auto, um, just in case it messed up at some point. Underneath that is language. Obviously, you can just choose a language. Then you can reset the guide. So basically, when you first turn on this camera, there's a guide that will show you which sides of the screen to swipe from to get to different settings. You can reset that if you've maybe forgotten and you want to start again. Then you can calibrate the, the gyro, which is obviously great for stabilization. So if you feel, feel like your stabilization is not working properly, perhaps go into that and calibrate that. And then, of course, there's factory reset. So let's come back out of general, go into Bluetooth remote. And obviously this is just where you connect a Bluetooth remote, it's pretty self-explanatory really. Go into Wi-Fi settings, you go auto on or off, or always on. I just leave this on auto on and off because generally it just turns on when it needs to turn on. Underneath the Wi-Fi settings, we have the setting to connect to AirPods. I think you can use the AirPods um, as a microphone and also to listen back to your videos and stuff, so it's quite handy. So that's how you connect them. And then we have screen auto sleep. Again, this is just after a while, the screen will sort of turn off um, after not touching it for a while. By default, this is 30 seconds. I'm actually gonna change this to three minutes because it's doing my head in when I'm recording this video. Um, but yeah, and you can also set where it actually turns off during recording. So to save battery, obviously, again, if you've got it in a position where you're not gonna be touching the screen anyway, or looking at the screen anyway, you can set the screen to sleep during recording so that after 30 seconds of recording, for example, the screen will go to sleep and you'll save a bit of battery life and get that bit extra out of the recording. So let's go back and over to voice control. Now this is just a way to see all the voice commands that you can do once you've turned that voice control on option on that we looked at earlier. You've got take a photo, start recording, stop recording, mark that or shut down the camera. You can view these in different languages if you want to know what voice control settings are available in different languages. Underneath that we have SD card and obviously it just show you how much space you've got left on the SD card and the option to format it as well. It's important to note that when you put your micro SD card in, you're really going to want to format this inside the camera. Um, and again, if you're switching SD cards between different cameras, make sure you format it in the camera that you're using it in before you use it, just to avoid any corruption issues.
Let's go over to audio mode now. Again, I don't know why this is hidden um, deep within the settings. You're not gonna really wanna change this too much because it's hidden that far in. Um, but you've got stereo, directional enhancement, um, which I guess just makes it go in one particular direction for, um, for like vlogging and things like that. Um, or wind reduction, which is pretty self-explanatory. This is probably gonna make it a little bit less bassy, a little bit more tinny, um, but will reduce any wind noise in the process. And then under that, we have the camera info, like your serial number and things like that. So let's now go through the modes and see what we've got um, in these. So if you swipe again across the screen, you can see there's 13 different modes. So let's start with what they call number one, which is burst. So burst is pretty self-explanatory, just takes a few photos and a burst. I think it's nine photos that it ends up taking. Um, so down here, again, you can change the different settings. So if you click that, you can change it from a 48 megapixel four by three image, which is using the full width of the sensor, or you can have like a 16 by nine, 36 megapixel image. Um, again, 16 by nine is more like sort of TV size, um, but you're not using the full width of the sensor. So it does bring down the megapixels a little bit. Underneath that, you can also set the timer as well if you wanted it to wait a few seconds before taking the burst shot. This is quite good for like a big group photo or something. If you just wanna set up the camera, um, set it to like a 10 second timer, run away, go to the other side, uh, get in the group and then take the photo as a burst so that you know you can pick one where nobody's blinking. So if I quickly go ahead and take a burst shot, you'll see that it captures and tells you to keep the camera still. And then when you go to preview it, it will actually say, check the burst photo in the app. So there's some things that you can do on the camera or that you can take on the camera that you can't actually preview back on the camera. And one of those things is burst. So let's go back off of that. And let's go to the next menu setting, which is star laps. Now star laps isn't something I already get into, but it seems to considerably brighten up the image no matter what shutter speed or ISO you're actually in. Um, you can choose down here what megapixel you want it to be in. There's only the option between 12 and nine megapixel. Not sure, again, why that is, but those are the options you're given. And then you can choose the length of the star lapse down here. One thing it doesn't actually say though, is how long it's gonna to take to create that. So once you just press record, you just sit and hope for the best. Um, this is a feature that confuses even me. So let's go on to the next feature now, and that is night mode. So this does take night photos. Again, it's only nine megapixels or 12 megapixels. And you can choose um, to put a timer on on the bottom there as well. So that will do a little countdown and it'll take a night photo. What I'm assuming this does is take a kind of long exposure photo and uses a stabilization to make sure it's not too shaky. In night photo mode, if I swipe from the right, you see I've got the option between JPEG and JPEG and RAW. So obviously if you want the raw photo and you can edit, you are gonna to have to do, go into it manually and change it to JPEG and raw. So let's swipe over from that and we've got interval mode. So interval is just, again, taking photos every few seconds. You can go into this. Again, you've got the full resolution, 48 megapixel at four by three or 36 megapixel at 16 by nine. And you can choose the interval, interval in which the photos are taken as well. Over in this mode, again, you have the option between JPEG and JPEG and RAW, but you can also change the exposure settings like you could in the video mode um, because it's not a dedicated like night mode or anything like that. Swiping over them, we've got HDR photo. And in HDR photo, you can't actually control the um, manual exposure as such, but by swiping from the right, you can change how many photos are taken in the HDR image. So basically what it's doing is taking three different photos at different exposures, then putting them all together to create a nice high dynamic, high dynamic range image. Now you can choose three photos, five photos, seven or nine. Obviously nine photos is probably gonna get the best results, but it's probably gonna take the longest. Um, so I wouldn't recommend that if you're in a rush. And with the EV step, this is basically telling the camera you want it to take a, ca a photo at a normal exposure and then a photo at minus two and then a photo at plus two. And then you can change this as much as you want. So if you've got a particularly difficult image to take a photo of, then you can set it so it takes a photo at minus four on the exposure and then plus four as well. Plus or minus two is definitely a good middle ground for this, but I would experiment with different settings um, depending on your situation. HDR is another one of those modes where you can't actually preview it back on the camera. You have to do it on the app. So we will get into that in a bit. Um, and if you go into the settings down here, 
you'll notice again we've only got 12 megapixel or 9 megapixel. Not sure why that is with HDR because you should still be able to use the full width of the sensor. Um, but I'm assuming it's something to do with the speed that it has to take the photos. Maybe it can't take that many 48 megapixel photos um, in a row. And you are going to get a JPEG out of this, so there's no option to get a raw image from the HDR picture. Going over to just regular photo mode then, and you've got your usual options as before, and you've got your timer at the bottom. And if you swipe from the right, you've got the option for JPEG, JPEG and RAW, and also Pure Shot. Pure Shot is kind of their like pre-edited JPEG. Um, so it will come out as a JPEG, but then it will edit it to make it look just a little bit cleaner. Um, it's like turning up the clarity slider in Lightroom. It just makes things better for social media, basically. So if you want it to edit it for you, Pure Shot's a good way. If you just want the JPEG from what you see, then JPEG is good. But if you want to edit it afterwards as a RAW file, then obviously you want JPEG and RAW. And just like before, you can change from auto or manual exposure as well. Swapping over then to video. And we already went a little bit into the video modes earlier, but you've got 4K, 2.7K or 1080p. And depending on that, you've got different frame rates. So they all go up to 60 frames a second. Um, and there is actually a slow-mo option, which we'll get into in a second, which allows you to go higher than 60 frames per second, but you can't do that in the regular video mode. You'll notice in the video mode, we've got different stabilization options at the top. Flow state stabilization is the default stabilization. And what this is, is it does all the stabilization in camera. You don't have to do anything afterwards. So if you're transferring it to your phone, or transferring it straight from the SD card onto your computer, the stabilization is gonna be already built in. You can also choose post stabilization. Now basically for this, the stabilization isn't done in camera. Instead, the camera is just capturing a raw, unstabilized image and also the gyro data. And then when you import that into Insta360 Studio, you can then choose your stabilization in there. Again, if you wanna get a bit more into the nitty gritty of the editing, this might be a good option. But if you're just doing this for social media or a quick video, then I don't recommend doing this. I recommend just doing it in camera on flow state. Now, moving on over then to HDR video. Now, HDR video is for those high dynamic range situations where it's difficult to get everything in the shot without overexposing or underexposing. This is only available in 4K at up to 30 frames per second, so you can't get any other resolutions like HD or 2.7K. Um, and you also won't be able to film in slow motion in HDR. But it is actually really clever that we've got HDR video um, in 4K with the stabilization on. That's something which is pretty unique to this camera. Again, in HDR video, swiping from the right, you're not going to be able to change um, any of the exposures. It's going to do that all automatically for you. And swiping over then to time lapse. Time lapse is pretty self explanatory. You've got your resolution, which is only available in 4K. And then you've got your sort of interval of how long you want it to leave between photos. Um, and then you can just get started on that by just clicking that. And then what this is gonna do is it's gonna show you a little timer at the bottom. Now you wanna keep this going for obviously as long as possible to get your longest, to get as long a time lapse as possible. But this will stop when it reaches the desired amount of time to get the seconds that you've put in. Now time shift is a bit different to time lapse in that it's more of a sped up video. So it's more like, for example, when you're in the car and you just want a sort of sped up video of going from A to B, that sort of situation. So basically what you do is you take a video when you press record and it will just speed it up for you in post. You can also control the speed in the app, which again, we're gonna get into. So then changing over to slow motion, like I mentioned earlier, in slow motion, we can get 2.7K up to 100 frames per second, or you can go to 1080p at 200 frames per second. I think you do get audio from this as well, which is good. But it is kind of weird that we have to switch over to a separate mode in order to get slow motion. But I guess, again, this is targeted at consumers, regular consumers that might not know much about cameras. And it's quite important to note that if you're changing over to slow motion, then you're probably going to lose a little bit of low light capabilities as well. So moving on then to loop recording. Again, pretty self-explanatory. You can change your resolution, your frame rate, um, and what you want the loop to be. And finally, we have the 6K widescreen mode. This will give you a little warning, so it's not recommended in low light environments. But this is recording a 6K image, which is higher quality than the 4K image, um, but you won't actually get the full 16 by nine image. You're gonna get a sort of cropped version. You know that like you see in the films, where you've got the black bars on the top and the bottom. That's what you're gonna get here um, when you're recording in 6K, just because of the limitations of the sensor. And I think that's everything on the camera for the 4K boost lens. So let's now switch to the 360 lens um, to see what settings we have in there.
Okay, so now we've got the 360 lens on and you'll see it's a pretty similar screen um, that you get greeted with, except this time it does fill the full screen. And that's because it doesn't matter because you're recording a whole 360 image anyway. So again, you've got the mode down here and your settings down here. But if you double tap this, you can then move around the image and see how you're framing it up. And then once you're framed at the bit that you want to look at, you can just go back there. So in the 360 video mode, you'll notice if you click on the options there, it goes up to 5.7K. And that's because the 360 module is capable of 5.7K. Don't take this to be higher quality than the 4K from the 4K Boost module though, as 5.7K is the whole 360 image. So by the time you've zoomed into it to get the image you want, it's gonna be probably around 1080p. Going into the different modes, you've changed a little bit. So instead of slow motion, you've got bullet time, which is pretty much a similar thing, but you'll see the little bullet time sticks that they do where you can sort of swing it round you um, and it goes into slow motion. So you've got the option to do that here. So with the 360 module on, this magnifying glass actually changes its feature. So with the 4K boost module, you can obviously choose whether you want to shoot wide, ultra wide, narrow or linear. But the 360 module on, you're going to shoot the whole 360 image anyway. So this just controls how you're actually going to view it while you're shooting it. So if I click on that, this is the default view that you see here. And like I said before, you can double tap. You can actually use this as well to just flip the image straight away so you don't have to scroll straight around it. But if I come off that and use the magnifying glass, I can switch to a fisheye view, which is a slightly wider view, and do the same thing. So you can get more in the image there on the screen. And if I click it again, it will switch to a tiny planet view. Not sure why you want to view the 360 lens like this when you're recording, unless this is the look you're going for. Um, but you can still do it that way. So there's three different views you can use when you're recording 360 videos. You also notice going into the settings that the stabilization settings have gone. Um, so you just get one sort of stabilization mode uh, when you've got the 360 mod on. And that's the main differences between controlling the camera with the 360 module on um, as opposed to the 4K boost module. So let's switch over to the phone app now and see what we can do in there. Okay, so we've opened the Insta360 app and we've got it connected to the camera. And there's quite a lot to unpack in the Insta360 app. So in this video, we're just gonna be going into how it controls the camera rather than all the extra features that you can do on the back side of it. So we've got the 360 module attached and you see if I just go like that, we can just move around the 360 image quite easily. We can zoom into it if we wanted to. It just pings back out. On the top left, we can see the SD card space that we have left and also the battery percentage there, which is currently at 14%. Then at the top, we've got our color modes. So if I click that, we can then go to standard, vivid, or log, as we saw before. On the top right, we have our frame rate and resolution. So again, we're at 5.7K at 30 frames per second. We can change that there. On the top right, we have these three little dots. And if you click them, we get the option for a histogram, which is quite useful for framing up your shot, which ends up up there. You can also turn on the GPS, which basically transfers your phone's GPS data onto the camera and saves in the metadata. So if you're trying to do a Google Street View sort of image um, or tour, then this will be helpful for that. On the middle right side of the phone when you're using the 360 module, you'll notice this little airplane icon here. If you click the airplane icon, it'll go into what's called fly-through mode. And basically you can use fly-through mode um, it's basically a 2D image, so you won't be getting the full 360 image. But you can use it if you want to like do this sort of flying FPV drone effect without actually having to use an FPV drone. In fly-through mode, you can use the invisible selfie stick to fly through objects, pause the video, and then go around to the other side of the objects and resume the video. And it'll look like you've just flown through it. So on the bottom left there, you have your preview window, which we'll get into in a second. Obviously your record button. And then we have your exposure settings as well. So again, we're in auto exposure at the moment, but we can change that over to manual if we want. At the bottom here, we have all the different modes we went through earlier, but you can just swipe for them like this, which is probably a lot easier than doing it on the camera. Um, but if you didn't want to swipe through them, you just wanted them all at a glance, you could click those three lines there and you get all of your modes at a glance there. So it's actually just an easier way of using the camera, provided you're okay with connecting your phone up. 
um, but there's not actually many features that it unlocks. So you can pretty much do everything within the camera. One of the main things you can't do in the camera is preview a lot of the things that you've taken. So burst photos, HDR, that kind of thing isn't visible until you've actually connected it to your phone and imported it onto your phone. So let's go to the preview button and actually look at some of the stuff we've taken. So once we're in a preview menu, we can basically switch between different videos and photos by clicking these arrows on the right. And you'll see we've got to that little burst photo we took earlier. So it's taken nine different shots and you can just click on them to view them. They're obviously pretty similar because we're just quite stationary here. Choose which one you want and then adjust that and export it. I'm actually going to come out of the preview window and go into that album. So if you go into the album, it gives you a bit of a better view um, of what you've taken. So if I can just scroll through the album, I can see these tiny little icons on the bottom left to show whether it's HDR or night mode or a video. So like I said earlier, I'm just focusing on the features of the app specific to this camera, but there's loads of different editing tools you can do to your photos, like Color Plus and different kind of filters and adjustments you can make, but that's a whole other video entirely. This is also true with video. You can make trim edits, you can cut bits out and put them together, you can add filters, you can change the speed. There's so many different things you can do to edit the video in this app. And there's even more features for editing 360 video, like adding keyframes, changing the aspect ratio. You can also use their snap mode, which allows you to move the phone around and act as the cameraman in real time as the video plays. You can also use their AI auto mode, which pretty much edits it for you, using AI to pick out different parts of the video it thinks you will like, and then changing the camera angles automatically. And a personal favorite feature is the picture in picture, uh, where you can actually choose two different angles and have them show next to each other or in a split screen view. So I appreciate this has been very brief in terms of the editing of the photos and videos, but like I said, if I was to go into all of the features of the app, we'd be here all day. If an Insta360 app tutorial is something you'd like to see, then do hit that thumbs up button and comment down below. Okay, so the Insta360 Studio is another thing I wanted to mention for Mac and PC. Again, it's something that probably requires its own video, but I just wanted to go through some of the basic features in this video. So let's start by importing some of our clips from the camera. So when it comes to editing raw DNG photos on here, you don't have much control, but you can turn on their pure shot, which kind of gives it a nice little vibrant grade so you can export it straight away. And you can also actually change the field of view after the fact on photos. So even if you take the photo in ultra wide, you can still change the field of view to wide linear or narrow afterwards. When you're editing 360 photos, you can go in and reframe your photo, obviously zoom in, zoom out, pan around the image. And you can also turn pure shot on or off. And you have a bit more control over some of the stitching options here as well. Although generally the stitching is really good, so I'll just leave it as normal. When viewing your 360 photos, down at the bottom right, you have different perspective options. So you can choose one that best suits your needs. For 4K video, you can choose a beginning and an end point, and you can also use the time shift feature to speed certain parts of the video up. And if you wanted to make it that little bit more vibrant, you can add the color plus feature, which again just adds vibrance and saturation to the image, just in case you wanted to put it straight on social media. With 360 video, you can actually choose to turn the flow state stabilization on or off, which if anything is just cool to turn it off and see how much stabilization is actually going on. Again, you have some fine control over the stitching. You can go into the image processing and add color plus if you wanted some of that saturation and vibrance. You can choose aqua vision, which is basically for when you're underwater just to, just to correct those colors a bit. And you also have a couple of audio controls here to change some of the audio. One of those is voice focus, which is good if you're vlogging and you just want your voice to be heard over the background noise. And the other is noise reduction. If you've say got wind noise or some sort of background noise going on, that can be handy too. Editing 360 video as well, you can also add keyframes to reframe the image. So if you wanted to move the camera in the middle of a shot, you can do that with the keyframe feature. One of the most impressive features of the Studio app though, is the deep tracking feature. So say you've got an image that's moving around screen, but you want to track that one specific person or object. You can do that with deep tracking. All you've got to do is draw a square around the object, click start tracking, and the camera will just follow that object or person around. In this use case, I'm actually at the same point of the image at all times, um, but if I was moving the camera around, it would just track me the whole time. On the bottom right here, we can also change our aspect ratio. So we go 16 by nine by default, but you can also go nine by 16 if you want to export for mobile. You can go one by one for that square sort of image, or you can go two by 35 by one for a more widescreen image. Finally, on the bottom right is that big yellow export button where you can export your videos or photos onto your desktop or hard drives. To get the best quality out of your exported videos, Insta360 recommends going into format and changing it to ProRes 422. Just bear in mind, this is probably gonna make your file size a bit larger.
So that's been a complete features and settings guide to the Insta360 ONE RS. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, hit that thumbs up button down below. I'm also going to be making a review on this camera. Um, so if you're interested in that, I'll put it up here somewhere when it's done and link it down below in the description. If you want to see more videos like this on cameras and travel and things like that, hit that subscribe button. And if you've got any comments or questions about this camera, leave them in the comment section down below and I'll do my best to get back to them. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.